So thank you, Michelle High, Managing Editor, American Purpose. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. Thank you all for making time. We have a really splendid group. group. You all are punctual. Sorry to keep you waiting a minute or two. Others will join us in the next three, four, five minutes. That's the way that goes. But it's great to see all of you. We have two distinguished speakers, conversation partners, scholars, uh, whom I've met recently and corresponded with with great pleasure. They have an extremely interesting, timely, and difficult subject in their new book. I'm going to turn it over to Kate Epstein. Kate is friend, scholar, historian from Rutgers. She is a member of the editorial board of American Purpose. Kate, thank you for your initiative in helping to create this program today. You have the floor to introduce our guests, to moderate the conversation, and I'll remind all of you, we do hard stops, so hard stop 1 p.m. Eastern. Kate, welcome. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's uh, it's great to be here. I want to apologize to everyone for my backdrop um, uh, recliner. Um, so I, I, I woke up uh, with some bug today um, and uh, sitting up at a desk just seemed a bit too taxing. So I apologize. Um, I also apologize for what a friend called my Parisian street urchin gloves, um, but my hands get cold um, in our in our house. So um, anyway, thanks to, to Jeff and Michelle for um, introducing uh, introducing me and for, for hosting this event. Um, it's been a real um, kind of pleasure for me in, in terms of my involvement with American Purpose to be able to propose um, events uh, with scholars whose work I admire. Um, and it's a, a particular pleasure here um, to have the opportunity to bring to the attention of a kind of a non-traditional academic crowd, a policy-oriented crowd, a business-oriented crowd, um, the work of two historians uh, whose work I don't think is as well known um, in the policy world as it ought to be. Um, unlike many people in the field of strategic studies, broadly defined to kind of enter the field seeking contemporary policy relevance, uh, the policy relevance of the book we're, we're here to discuss today uh, really emerged organically from uh, the author's uh, long engagement with the scholarly study of the history of science and technology and the history of U.S. foreign relations. And so the result is a book that doesn't simply kind of reflect conventional categories of analysis back at policymakers um, by trying to sort of bang the, the round pegs of history into the square holes of the present, um, but really it introduces potential new policy questions, I think, by letting the past speak in its own voice. Um, so let me turn to the speakers. Um, John Kriege is one of the world's most uh, distinguished historians of science and technology. He's the Kranzberg Professor of History Emeritus at Georgia Tech, past president of the Society for the History of Technology, which is the preeminent scholarly organization in the field, as well as winner of the prestigious Francis Bacon Award in the History of Philosophy of Science and Technology. Uh, being an overachieving type, uh, his PhD in the History of Science was actually his second PhD. Um, his uh, first is in physical chemistry, and uh, indeed John worked as a scientist before switching over to history. Uh, Mario Daniels, like me, is comparatively undereducated, uh, holding only a single PhD uh, in the history of science and technology. Uh, he's listed in on the announcement for uh, today's talk as the DAAD visiting professor at the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University. I shudder to think what a multi-hyphenate that would be in German. Um, but that was actually his last job. Um, he's now at the Duitsland Institute at the University of Amsterdam, serving as the uh, DAAD Fachlektor. And I can see why he doesn't want to advertise that since Fachlektor sounds vaguely indecent. Um, previously, he taught at the universities of Tübingen and Hanover. Uh, the central question of his research is how um, concepts of national security have shaped the politics of sharing and denying scientific technological knowledge in international relations. Um, this is the book uh, just out with University of Chicago Press. Um, the format 
is going to be for me to ask them a few converse, uh, a few questions to just sort of get the conversation going. Um, depending on, on how we do, um, we'll probably go to about 1230 um, with me asking questions, but then open it up um, to Q&A um, for, for people to chime in. I'll try to remember to say this when we kind of open it up as well, but feel free to kind of raise your hand using the the raise hand function in Zoom or put your question in the chat area, either works. Um, so let me um, let me turn to, uh, to interrogating uh, John and Mario. So I wanna open with um, uh, kind of a, a, a big question, because um, I'm always interested in the, uh, the history of, of the history, so to speak. Um, so how, how did you two come to write this book? What prompted it? Do you wanna start, Mario? Okay, can start. So actually by accident, I mean, no one runs into export controls on a daily basis unless you work with them. Um, so this uh, actually started many years ago when I was uh, doing research on the uh, history of economic uh, espionage. And I, I'm still interested in that. And I realized that in the US context, uh, whenever there is a discourse uh, about economic espionage, very quickly, there is also a discourse about export controls. And back then, I just did not get the connection between those two things. I thought, okay, this is about trade. This is about stealing ideas. And actually, at a conference, I had a, a conflict with a um, kind of senior uh, business historian uh, who attacked me uh, giving a, a talk. And he said, basically, you know, Mr. Daniels, you don't get it. Uh, export controls and economic espionage have no link whatsoever. You're completely wrong. And I didn't know very much about it. So I said, yeah, but my sources have all the time those two topics at the same time. So there must be a connection. And back then I actually started to do some deep digging and I had the feeling I was the only one to do this stuff of research. And then I ran into John at a conference and then uh, we started uh, to, about thinking, writing a, a proper book about it. So that's where it started. Very, very kind of basic, but that's how research projects start usually, I guess. John, how about you? I came at this from a rather different angle. I was invited to attend a town hall meeting at Georgia Tech with the scientific and engineering faculty addressed by the president of Georgia Tech and by the FBI. And the FBI, the aim of the FBI being there was to warn us that Chinese visitors and students were taking huge advantage of American openness in academia to steal in American intellectual IP. I was completely taken aback in several ways. Firstly, um, firstly, I did not think that the FBI was particularly present on my campus. Secondly, I didn't imagine that uh, that Chinese people would be in, and the FBI would be interested in unclassified research. I thought they might be interested in classified research, but in unclassified basic research was a surprise to me. And I was thirdly surprised because I learned that export controls were one of the instruments used to modify, to, to, to control this flow of knowledge. I always thought export controls dealt simply with dealing with goods. And here I learned that actually export controls were an instrument to control the flow of knowledge. That got me interested in studying export controls. I, gave, I published a quick paper on my first findings in the journal. I gave a paper in Jena in Germany. I think Mario was at that paper, at that conference. We met each other there. Uh, we found that we both were interested in export controls. In fact, we had an obsession to figure out exactly how it was that export controls were, were, were engaged, were functioning inside the national security state. And that was the start of a long journey of about 10 years, a travel that has brought us to this book today. Okay, thank you. I should actually, I should say too, um, just by way of, of introducing the, the book, um, it, it's hard, unless you kind of do this sort of work, it's hard to imagine or understand like just how much work went into Mario's and John's book, um, the research, um, it, it is just massive. I, I haven't done much work myself in the congressional sources um, that form a, a very considerable part um, of the research base. Um, but I, I remember being very impressed. Uh, well, first a bit crestfallen and then, then delighted. I'd found this um, a, a totally obscure um, set of documents in the, the 
uh, archives of the Department of Commerce. And I thought no one else will ever find these. Lo and behold, Mario had found them. Um, and it came up once in a chat. And um, thank God he, he got to them first because he knew much better what to do with them than I would have. Um, and so it's it's really become the, those those documents are really fascinating um, lens onto something John just alluded to, which is the the government's interest in controlling unclassified knowledge. Um, that that classification, although we tend to kind of center understandings of secrecy on that, um, it, it, that there's actually all these other tools, um, and the U.S. government is very interested in lots of types of scientific technological knowledge that are not in fact classified. Um, so let me um, uh, kind of segue into another kind of big picture question about the book. One of the major arguments uh, that you make in the book is that export controls have a long history. So they've been, you know, it, it would be hard to find a more kind of contemporary subject at the moment, um, given the current use of export controls um, in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine as part of a broader campaign uh, to, to punish uh, and potentially deter um, Russia. Um, obviously, they were in the news a huge amount um, in the context of the, the Trump administration's um, uh, policy towards China. Um, but, one, but one of the kind of arguments slash revelations of the book is that export controls actually have quite a long history um, in the United States, there's actually a lot of continuity um, alongside some of the changes that the Trump administration initiated. Um, and the history of export controls has actually been quite closely related, um, the book argues, to the exercise of US global hegemony. And so I wonder if you could just unpack that argument, that connection between the history of export controls and the history of US uh, hegemony. Um, since most people here won't have had a chance to read the book yet. Mm -hmm. Shall I start, Mario? Yeah, yeah John, go ahead, please. Okay, I think one way of thinking about export controls is seeing them as an instrument that the United States uses to structure the world trading system in R&D intensive manufacturing processes and products. The legal tools used to protect Americans' te technological lead on which its political, military, and even ideological power depends. So the consolidation of US hegemony through export controls, I think, can be seen in many ways, and Mario will add his own, but I'll just stress two axes. From the very beginning, um, um, the export control system that the United States defined in the Export Control Act of 1949 was intended to be multilateral, and they imposed on, its, on their allies an institution called COCOM, the Coordinating Committee for Multilateral Export Controls, in which they obliged European partners and Japan to align their export policies with America's export policies in the name of national security. Europeans had very different attitudes and perceptions of national security, but in order to collaborate with the United States in this way, they had to accept that they'd adopt, and they did with reluctance and increasing reluctance, American concepts of national security in their export control policies. In this way, the whole global trading system was structured around American concepts, at least in R&D intensive products and processes of what national security entailed during the Cold War. Another way in which they worked was by being extraterritorial. Export controls actually uh, are, impose constraints on countries that buy American goods and processes. So for example, if a German firm buys something from IBM, and wants to export it to a third country, it needs to respect American export control regulations to that third country. It, even if Germany has different export control patterns, say with East Germany, to what the United States has. This extraterritoriality imposes a further capacity for the United States to shape the global system of trade in its own interests, although of course it argues those are in the interests of the entire free world. So these two aspects, I think, especially extraterritoriality and, and aligning through multilateral arrangements, European export controls practices with American practices are two ways in which America expresses hegemony through export control and have done since 1949. Thanks, Mario, did you wanna jump in at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can uh, add a little bit to that. Um, I mean, really, if you look at, at the moment of, of the birth of the system, it's really the 1940s. So the very moment when the US becomes probably for the first time uh, a, a global power and understands itself um, as, as a global power. 
uh, that wants to reorganize the international order and places uh, the US at the, at the very center of this. Um, so the Export Control Act of 1949 really is born at the very same time as many other um, um, international organizations uh, under um, um, American leadership. Um, so like the, the UN or, or the World Bank uh, or uh, GATT, and uh, in the middle of that, you have really an export uh, uh, regime, export control regime. It has a little bit longer, uh, longer history as we show in our book, uh, going back to, to World War I. But we argue basically that you have to understand the experience of World War II and the experience of the early Cold War to understand why there is actually an export, export control system. Because historically the US uh, had only um, export controls in place during wartime. And if you look at uh, the history of this regime, which really goes back to the 1940s without a break in between up to the present day, you could argue that of course there was uh, uneasy uh, peace here and there, but it was also kind of a, a peacetime period. Um, and so if, to understand why there is this system, I would argue, and we argue that in our book, you have to understand really this perception of the globe as something that has to be organized according to American ideas of how the international system should look like. And in the middle of the system, and I think that's important, is actually scientific technological knowledge, which is usually uh, overlooked by researchers. Uh, they usually look just at the international order and maybe as a, as a uh, afterthought, there's a little bit of uh, reflection on maybe technology and maybe uh, particularly nuclear technology. But we argue actually that at the heart of this um, new system, there is a thinking about the relationship between economic political power on the one hand and the production and dissemination of scientific technological knowledge on the other hand. And this kind of connection between knowledge and power is then institutionalized during the 1940s. We know a lot about the, the innovation system, about the R&D side, but our book shows that there is also a side of restriction and control of knowledge. And another thing I want to stress is to understand this, you also have to understand, uh, as John uh, already alluded to, the concept of national security, how it develops, how it's uh, conceived, uh, by, by American uh, thinkers and how it changes over time. Uh, because it's, it's not a stable category. It has a history uh, uh, itself. And this history needs to be reflected upon to understand why there is also uh, an export control system. That was one of the things, I mean, that you do very well in the book, I thought was, was I mean, in, 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 in history, we would call it historicize uh, national security, not treat it as this kind of like free floating thing that's always meant the same thing to different people in US history, uh, but that's something that's changed its meaning over time. One of the other kind of concepts you do that for in the book is uh, the concept of economic security, which has a, a, a history that's related to national security as a concept, but also is kind of conceptually distinct um, and one of the one of the things that to me was was fascinating about the book actually is um, I suppose you could call it the robustness of the export control regime. Um, the way it really it starts in the context of of two antagonistic relationships: the the war against the, the Axis in World War II, and then the the Cold War against the Soviet Union. But then in the the 70s and especially the 80s, as you chart, really shifts into a tool for navigating relations with an ostensibly friendly power in Japan, um, as the United States really began to worry about sort of national decline vis-a-vis um, -vis Japan. And so the, the regime that survived into the 90s and eventually became kind of turned against China principally um, is a very, um, I don't know, prote pro protean? Uh, regime, you know, you can really put it to a bunch of different um, geopolitical uses. Um, and so that, that which was fascinating to me. Um, let me ask one more um, kind of big picture question, and then, then we'll 
uh, open things up to audience q and a i think um so the the last question i want to ask is based on your findings what do you think scholars of us foreign policy get wrong or overlook about export controls and then kind of conversely what do you what do you think studies of export controls have to add to the field of kind of strategic studies or, or U.S. foreign policy history. You want to start, Maria? You start this time. Uh, yeah, I can do that. I mean, the, the first thing I would argue is um, what do they overlook? Export controls in general. <laughs> there is hardly any historian. I mean, there are some, but a, 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 any historian or, or political scientist who, who really deeply engages with export controls. But sometimes they are mentioned, and sometimes they are, uh, uh, you have maybe a, a small case study showing how export controls maybe work, but there is not really a lot of deep uh, engagement with, with export controls and how they work. and. Uh, what their logic is and how they uh, they basically fuel the interaction between governments, the, the interaction between governments on the one hand and uh, business companies on the others, or as we show also between governments and universities. So the nitty gritty of export controls is usually really overlooked. But our book shows that to understand kind of the daily practice of diplomacy, you should look first of all at the, the question of sharing knowledge and sharing technology, and then how export controls actually intervene in these relationships of sharing and, and denial. And I would argue that um, uh, by looking at technology and sharing and denial um, practices, you understand much better how uh, the, the daily practice of of geopolitics and the, the daily practice of diplomacy works. Uh, I usually tell my, my, my students when they're a little bit skeptical about uh, export controls, and you, they usually are, they think it's, it's the most boring thing you can come up with, but I usually tell them, you know, you, you, you must understand that uh, people like Henry Kissinger took time during their, their daily routine to talk about, for example, computers and about really mundane details of computer technology uh, with their colleagues like the prime minister of, of the UK to, to, to basically uh, shape uh, uh, inner west uh, relations and then also east-west relations. So I'm not sure if that's a good argument. If Henry Kissinger thinks they are relevant, you should also care about them. But I think it's actually really interesting to see that export controls are not just highly specialized. They are really part of almost any kind of diplomacy you, you, you see uh, since the 1940s. So that's, that's my point I want to make. Uh, John. Yeah, I think, I think the problem is that uh, foreign students of foreign relations tend to get stuck at 30,000 feet. <laughs> if you get down into the everyday relationships of uh, inside the American government, which manages the construction and deconstruction of alliances, you find an enormous amount of debate between different arms of the government about export controls and foreign policy. This comes through in our book in the multiple studies that we show of the, of the conflicts and disputes between the Commerce Department the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and the State Department. The State Department, of course, representing foreign policy. And at the heart of those debates are really what can we share, what can we deny in terms of technology, knowledge, and know-how with this or that ally or this or that, uh, that rival. And these are very, very long and complicated and often very divisive debates. So foreign policy is made, in fact, in many instances, through export controls. And another way of looking at it is from the point of view of grand strategy. I mean, when you think about the changing positions towards China taken by various presidents, shall we say, let's say from the Korean War up to the early 70s, a total, total blackout, total refusal to have any kind of trade with China. Then we have the uh, Reagan's position, which is China can be treated as a friendly non-allied country. Then we have Clinton as a constructive engager with China. Then we have Trump as a systemic rival with China. These big foreign policy strategies are translated into export control policies, which are really important. I mean, Reagan, for example, inherits a policy of what is called the China differential, where China should get less than Russia does. He inverts that. 
He accelerates trade with China. Clinton drops all trade barriers with China as soon as he can, at least not all, but as many as he possibly can. And Trump again, of course, reimposes a whole lot of enormously important and restrictive trade barriers over knowledge and technology with China. So these all dovetail with each other and you really can't understand how these grand policy statements are translated into practical policy. I think and one way of understanding them rather is through looking at the export controls that we study in depth in the book. And the other way around too, isn't it, right? I mean, the, the, the making of like problems that arise in export controls also then in turn actually can re-affect grand strategy. So it's not just a downward push from grand strategy, it's actually an upward push from kind of the daily problems that arise in export controls. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking Mario, for instance, I know, you know, the, the well, it's both of you, um, but I, I've talked about it more with Mario, just kind of the, the limits on, um, on high performance computing power, yeah, um, you know, where to draw that line exactly. Um, and I, I'll get the units wrong, but you know, it's however many- M tops. And thank you. I was going to say watts. And I was like, I'll just pick the first <laughs> unit that comes to my mind. Uh, whatever unit of computing power, you know, where do you draw that line? But then what what I think what's the dynamic you're charting in the book is that what the high level policymakers are kind of hearing from the uh, the bureaucrats um, and the experts who actually have to implement export controls is you might want to rethink your grand strategy um, based on what we're seeing kind of down here in the weeds, um, because there's there's some stuff going on um, that you, you really ought to be taking into account. Um, so um, okay. yeah, I'd, I'd say, like uh, to, oh I'd, yeah. I'd like to make a, just another point because it sounded like we are just criticizing uh, uh, historians of diplomacy uh, or, or foreign relations. Actually, um, many other groups could also learn much uh, from, from export <laughs> controls, I think. You so, criticize everyone. Not, I mean, everyone is true. I mean, everybody should should know everything about export control. Yeah, that's go. that's that's uh, what what the nerd always thinks, right? <laughs> but I would also argue that uh, if you are interested in international business, if you are interested in the relationship of um, uh, multinational companies, uh, especially in the high technology field, you should know a lot about export controls. I mean. I uh, once talked to, to uh, scholars who work on, on Philips, uh, a Dutch um, uh, multinational, one of the biggest uh, during the Cold War period, and they did not even know that export controls exist. So that's, that's one group. I would also argue that everybody who, who uh, uh, is interested in globalization and the processes of globalization and how states uh, inject themselves into the processes of globalization, export controls are a perfect field to understand that, right? To see how states use, use their state power and their bureaucracies to, to shape certain um, features of, of uh, globalization. So there, there's, there are a lot of dimensions there that are not just foreign relations. It's also very much about thinking about uh, uh, economics, about global markets, uh, about how, how uh, IP, for example, uh, is shifted around and who has an interest, uh, interest in sharing and who has maybe an interest in denial of IP. Right. So it's, it's actually a multifaceted field uh, and it's really not just about trade. It's very much about foreign policy. It's about knowledge. Um, it's about um, education, uh, and academia, uh, for sure. Yeah, and, and academia, yeah. indeed. And so yeah. you see, actually, it has so many layers and that makes it interesting. Yeah. And we tried in our book to make those layers also visible because mostly they're not visible to, to, the, to, to the layman or to the laywoman. Yeah. Um, you, you have to do deep research actually to see how uh, export controls impact a lot of uh, dimensions of, of international uh, contact. Yeah, and you also have to, I mean, one of the things that makes this sort of subject hard to study is you also have to really familiarize yourself with multiple literatures <laughs> uh, yeah. for, from multiple fields. I mean, it's not just one or two subfields of historical inquiry, it's five different ones, plus some political science, plus actually some law. Um, and the, the law review literature. So um, it's, a, it's a tall order. 
All right, let me um, let me cut myself off there um, and open things up um, to the audience. As I say, I, feel free to you know, just sort of physically put your hand up or use the, the raised hand function or just put it in the chat. Um, just so um, RTM does not have to physically hold his hand up because um, it'll get tired. I think the digital hand is easier to hold up. Um, let, me, let me call on him first and then I see um, Fritz Heinsen and Patrick Jamal. So RTM first. Thank you so much uh, for this interesting talk. I'm actually based in uh, Berlin in Germany right now. And um, I, my, my question um, is the following. How does, uh, how does that relate to, um, to Tesla uh, opening their plant, their, big, or their first plant in, uh, in Germany? Um, it seems to me um, there is a... Um, it is related uh, to uh, foreign policy and international relations since Germany, uh, I think uh, I would correct me if I'm wrong, is the, one of the closest allies of the United States. And I think uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, it, is, um, it, does, it, it, it does relate to uh, knowledge regulation and, 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 and uh, the national security. State. Thank you so much. Shall I just answer quickly answer yeah, to the audience yeah. question? So um, yes, there is of course that it is an issue of of international technological relations, but it is not an export uh, control issue really because uh, Tesla and uh, Germany are close allies. Um, so in the logic of of export controls, there are uh, what is usually called countries of concern and uh, countries which are not of concern. And Germany would be in this um, uh, specific case, probably not a country of concern. It would be uh, a country of concern if, for example, there was a danger that Germany, for example, would share certain, uh, let's, see, let's say battery technologies with Chinese partners, then it would probably uh, become an export control issue. So export controls, um, uh, usually kick in only in cases which are seen as um, potentially dangerous or um, or uh, affecting uh, American foreign policy. I, I'm not aware right now that Tesla uh, ran into export control regulations in this specific case. Um, but I have not also I, I haven't done much research on that either. So um, maybe I'm I'm uh, over uh, doing my point here, but I would say it's not an export control issue. John, did you want to jump in on oh, that no. at all? Nope. No. Okay. Um, so um, Fritz Heinzen. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I read the table of contents. Sadly, that's all. And, and it sounds like an intriguing book I need to read the rest of. And as it's a history and, it, and what you have discussed sounds very interesting as history, but I'd like to ask a question. And it's the same question I asked Barry Strauss and about adding an extra chapter in a forthcoming edition. And maybe we could get Garrett Keeley and the University of Chicago Press to, to push you in that direction. Because with all this fascinating background, there seems to be a failure at times on export controls. And the reason I say that is um, RUSI, the uh, Royal United uh, Service Institute for Defense and Security Studies, just a couple of days ago, released a study on the weapons, the Russian weapons in Ukraine. And, and the, the two authors actually had handled the weapons, looked at them, and it was shocking some of the things they were finding, uh, the vast amounts of Western technology. And it's in missiles, it's in communications equipment. And they, as they point out, Almost all of Russia's modern military hardware is dependent upon complex electronics imported from the US, the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Japan, Israel, China, and further afield. In some instances, these components are civilian dual use electronics that can be procured commercially. In many more, however, they are pieces of military or specialized technologies for which there are a small number of regulated suppliers. So with that in mind, what I'm curious about is Coming back to this issue, taking all your historical work and looking at a contemporary now event, have you thought about doing that? Is this a, a possibility of future research 
for you folks because it would be interesting to see why is so much material showing up. And I'll post the links to this study. It's free online from Rusi, and and it case by case by case to see all of these components showing up in Russian equipment. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, our last guest is going to provide a, a, a chapter, as it turns out, to, to, to American Purpose. I, I would love to see what you two uh, would, would, would think about what's showing up in, in, uh, on Ukrainian battlefields. So let's, so let's say something, Mario. Yep. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Let, let, let we stress in the book how much contention and debate there is inside the government and between the government and industry over what can be shared and what denied. Uh, and of course, there's pressure a lobby from the business community all the time to sell more and more things to more and more age, to more and more clients. And you have the pushback and it's deep pushback from other parts of the government, the intelligence community, from Congress, from some. Uh, and, and of course, the balance obviously sometimes falls in favor of selling. I, mean, I wouldn't if, if you if, if this was China, you'd find exactly the same mix of goods, many of them bought from America, from America and all, all sorts of Western countries, because simply because the pressure, the business pressure sometimes is seen to overwhelm the security pressures. And I must stress also that here, in order for the United States to implement its conception of national security, it, it has to get Europeans to agree with that, and that often doesn't happen. So you have, you have therefore sometimes American businesses saying, look, if we don't sell it to them, somebody else will sell it to them behind our backs. So it's extremely difficult to have a unified view globally about what can be shared with whom. We don't work on, mis on weapons, we work on dual use technologies throughout our study, but it's clear for, for, there was a huge assault on Clinton in the late nineties because he was giving away high, com high performance computers, um, okay. a lot of telecommunications equipment, et cetera, to China. Uh, and of course, people were accusing him of putting profits ahead of national security. And that very complex political debate is an ongoing political debate. So we, we can't write another chapter now, we're exhausted, but we're not surprised to find this mix crossing the border in ways which we now find regrettable with the wisdom of hindsight, but at the time, the debate inside the governments fell in favor of excelling those things to Russia. Um, if, if I may add one or two sentences, I mean, you are also pointing at, at a dilemma, right? Because there's, there's a constant debate about, I mean, since the 1940s, basically, or the 1950s, at least, uh, if um, export controls actually work or if they are just, just a, a nuisance uh, to, to industry. I mean, um, and, you know, it is actually not really... Um, something you can find a, a proper answer to because um, empirically it is difficult to show that not sharing something works, right? I mean, you see the, the, the moments when something uh, uh, goes through and is actually uh, breaching the, the control, so to speak, that's something you can easily show, but it's difficult to show that export controls really are a good strategy to keep uh, your enemy behind. And that's one of the reasons why export controls were constantly, not just within the government, but also without the government, uh, heavily contested. I mean, uh, I, I said once, um, um, no one likes export controls, maybe only the export controllers. Uh, it's one of the most hated regimes, I would probably argue, uh, in the national security realm. Um, and your argument is exactly the argument many, uh, um, on the one hand, cr critics use against the export control uh, regime, saying, you know, you can't control the uncontrollable because technologies float around, especially in a globalized uh, um, uh, technological community. But your argument could also be used by the hawks who say, well, we need more export controls, right? We need to crack down on sharing and we need to control really almost anything because dual use is a very open concept. And if, if uh, you have a technology that is uh, at first sight harmless, you can use it for rockets, for example, right? And so you point directly really at, at one of the, the, the um, moments in, in the entire debates about uh, export controls, if they actually work or not. I don't know, 
quite honestly, even after working on export controls now for six, six, seven, or even 10 years, I still don't know how well they work. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate your honest answers. Very interesting. If I could also just add one point to, to something you both said, um, which is that it isn't a, a neat pro, uh, profits versus power dichotomy in the sense that one of the arguments you see a lot um, in um, kind of critiques of the export control regime being too, too harsh um, is that you actually need US business, um, the US defense industrial base to be able to sell abroad, partly so that they can stay in business and maintain a surge capacity for wartime. Right. Um, but also partly um, because um, you you want the you want the cutting edge <laughs> to be constantly moving forward, and if you clamp down too much on export controls, um, you actually choke off exactly the innovation um, that U.S. national security depends on. So it's a as you I mean yeah, the the book does such a good job of kind of explaining the kind of costs and benefits of of the various trade offs um, that are made. Um, okay, um, Patrick. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'd like to, uh, well, first, first of all, thank you for drawing attention to such an understudied field. Um, and um, I have two questions related uh, to each other. One is, what is the connection between uh, the field of, of, uh, 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 of sanctions, especially secondary sanctions, and uh, export controls? It seems that export control is a uh, kind of a part of, of sanctions. And uh, so if so, you know, what do you think is the, is the weight, if you want, the proportion uh, of, of export controls in most uh, secondary sanctions uh, regimes? Second question is, you know, relates to what you just said a, a little bit. Um, so can we have a sense of, you know, the efficacy of, of, of uh, export controls. I mean, you said that it's very difficult to evaluate, of course, but uh, even if it's um, not, you know, so efficient in itself, you know, it's created lots of tensions with, you know, European partners, especially, mm -hmm. uh, and tensions since I, I remember the, the case of the, of the Russian pub pipeline in the early 80s, and, the, and, uh, and there, there were many such cases. So, so is it, Overall, do you think uh, worth it? I mean, obviously you, you need to, to have some export controls, but you, you, what, what cases would you uh, point to that where you know, the political fallout has been so negative that you, know, you would have to rethink the uh, export controls measures that were taken and, and that were uh, so controversial? Thanks. Would you start, you start, Mario, on the sanctions at least, please? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so yeah, indeed, um, uh, whenever you see uh, the word sanctions, uh, behind that, there are usually export controls. So um, I'm, of course, exaggerating a little bit. There are many other forms of sanctions, like financial sanctions. They are very, very, have become very important since 9-11, basically. But uh, if you look at the, the package uh, against Russia uh, now uh, during the Ukraine war, a lot of that is really about really just ex export controls. But who, what we try to show in our book is that reducing export controls to sanctions would be wrong because uh, export controls are something that happens every day. So sanctions are really during emergencies or uh, emergency periods. And sometimes those emergency periods are very long, right? I mean, if you look at sanctions against Cuba, for example, you have a long period. But actually what we try to show is that export controls play a role every single day. If you look at the entire period uh, of the 1940s to, to the present day, you have probably, I'm not sure how many, but I would say, maybe even more than a million of uh, uh, license procedures for dual use technology. So it's several 10,000 a year during the Cold War. It's, it's much less today, but let's say you have every, every year uh, on average, something like uh, 20, 30,000, you, you get really at a very, very high number. 
So sanctions are a special case of export controls, I would argue. Uh, but I would not say that sanctions are just the most important part of the export control system. Um, John, do you want to talk about the, the um, efficiency yeah, I can, or? I can try. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's impossible to know if they're efficient, Patrick, but I do think that if one does a thought experiment and imagines not having them, I think it's unimaginable to do away with export controls. I mean, from the point of view of the American government and the American people, I mean, why are they there? They're there to protect American scientific and technological leadership in key areas, cutting edge technologies. They're meant in, to ensure that countries cannot simply acquire American cutting edge technology and, and develop their own kinds of technological systems, which will outbeat and outpace American systems. So if we want to protect American leadership uh, and based on American scientific and technology, we're gonna need some sort of system to control the global circulation of cutting edge technology, manufacturing processes and so forth. And just imagine, which is always what happens when this debate comes up, just imagine finding that America is attacked by China with a bunch of technologies that were actually made in America, developed in America and bought by China. Um, it would be, a, it would be unimaginable and unacceptable, I mean, probably to all of us, uh, but also to the American people to have such a situation. So this is a, this is a fence put up. It's not, a, it's not, it's a porous fence, but it is, it is a necessary fence, I believe, in order to make, if America wants to maintain its global position of global leadership. And in that sense, and I should stress that, you know, it's interesting that although governments, so the industry contests it and protests against it, it's on the excesses of the system and on what they see to be the, the, the unnecessary barriers put to trade, which they object to. The principle of the system is accepted as necessary. I mean, IBM, I believe, has 100 people in its head office working on export controls all the time. And nobody says that national security is something that we mustn't be concerned about and we mustn't protect. So the national security argument is a deeply important argument. And I think it's therefore impossible for the reasons I've given to abolish them. And we just, the idea is to just make them more effective, I suppose. And that's very hard to do in a global competitive economic system, but I think it's, we can't imagine doing away with them. You're, you're, you're Patrick, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. Um, yes, of course they are indispensable. I understand, uh, uh, you know, why, but, uh, but they have been used as, foreign policy instruments too, uh, like in uh, you know, wars that the United States didn't uh, you know, support, like uh, colonial wars and then you know, many other wars. So, so, it's, uh, you know, so, so, so they, they are also an instrument of foreign policy. That's just my point, yeah, isn't it? Yes, certainly. Yeah. So, um, one last point. I mean, that's more a historian's academics point, but um, even, even if you um, if, if you're skeptical about the uh, efficiency of export controls, you could always argue, okay, it's interesting to see that a regime that was so heavily criticized all the time is still in place. And you could say, okay, this is actually relevant because so many uh, historical actors found it relevant over decades. I mean, that's really an interesting thing, right? Even if you think they're, they're kind of a, a pain in the neck, um, they have always had supporters in, in the system. Um, and there were several moments when, when there was a debate about abolishing uh, export controls, right? Right after uh, the end of the Cold War, the, there was a moment when there was a, um, a broad discussion about the necessity of export controls. And back then, uh, most experts said, okay, yeah, we, we still need them because we have a proliferation problem. Now that the Soviet Union doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, we have rogue states who want to have rockets, for example. And we have a, a new uh, push in globalization. Maybe we have to think about economics and security uh, in a different way. So Japan was already mentioned. Um, so the system is heavily criticized, but it is in place and seems to have an inner logic that is accepted by many historical actors within and without government. And it seems to work somehow, uh, despite all the empirical problems to, to point out how it works. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, two more questions, it looks like. So I just wanna make sure um, that we have time for both of them. So I saw uh, Jonathan Schneer's hand go up first. 
It's nice to see you again, Jonathan. I think we met um, uh, some years ago. I'm, I wouldn't swear to it, but I think we did. Um, and, um, and then Shirley uh, Hargis, whose name I hope I pronounced correctly. Um, but um, Jonathan first. Thank you. And you can hear me now, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, well, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, and I have no expertise in it at all. And, and therefore, I think I'm confused and I have two questions that are connected. And the first question is, you're not only speaking about the United States, are you? Um, and I'm curious about other countries and their use of export controls. And secondly, it sounds to me like you're talking about post-1945 only. And I'm thinking, why were there not export controls before then? Um, certainly in the 1930s, um, but even in the years leading up to World War I, when technology like, say, dreadnought battleships had to be protected. So those are my two interlocking questions. Can I just say, read my book? <laughs> pre-World War I. <laughs> um, but, but actually, in, in Mario's and John's defense, they uh, they actually do go back much farther. Uh, oh, than okay. World War II. So let me let me turn it over to them. Thank you. Go ahead, Mario. Yeah, so there, there is a longer history to that. And indeed, our book starts actually with World War I. Okay. Um, to, to show the longer lines. Uh, but even in World War I, uh, it was still seen as a war regime. So it was basically uh, disbanded uh, after 1918 uh, and then kind of uh, reinvented during the 1930s step by step. So with the Japanese challenge uh, coming up, export controls showed up again and then were uh, institutionalized again during uh, the 1940s. So really during the war. But then was uh, that was actually in 45, again, the debate uh, about getting rid of them. And um, only step by step, it was, became clear that maybe there is a need for, for a regime that should be expanded into peacetime. And we show that process actually uh, in, in much detail. We have the first two chapters are really about this period. Um, and, and your first question, what was it again? Sorry. Other countries, other countries do, have, do they have them? Ah, yeah. Um, so other countries have export controls. Yes, I would argue that every, today every uh, industrialized nation more or less had a, has an export control system. Not, not every uh, nation has a functioning export control system, but the idea is that most uh, of them have uh, an export control system. But we argue that actually the US is a central actor in, historically in the establishment of this logic of export controls. And that's why we focus on, on the US, but we touch on the allies uh, within COCOM, uh, this, this uh, export control uh, organization during the Cold War. So, um, and by the way, there is a, uh, there's a massive need uh, for um, com comparative uh, scholarship. So we just did this for the US. Uh, I think we need much more of this re research also for other states. I, I play around with doing this maybe at some point for Germany, but I'm not sure if, if I want to do this again. <laughs> is it all right if, if, I, if I jump in here? Um, just to make sure we, we get Shirley's question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I make a quick comment, okay? Oh yeah, go, go ahead, John, sure. Just Jonathan, quickly, we, we concentrate on the United States, but also the period in peacetime, export controls have been heavily institutionalized in peacetime in the United States, that's a novelty. And by the way, for the interwar period, it's quite stunning to know that Ford's, uh, Ford, Ford Motor Works was open to hundreds of Soviet and Nazi engineers and scientists who came over to the United States, learned everything they could, and Ford himself took everything over to Nazi Germany to install motor car production systems which were used by the Nazis and by the Soviets. So um, there were no export controls of this kind in peacetime at that time. Uh, this is a novelty of the United States administration, and it's a huge rambling bureaucratic structure in peacetime in the US. Okay. Um, Shirley, last but not least. Thank you, Kate. And thank you both for this presentation. I'm really excited to look at your book. I work in sanctions, export controls, 
um, emerging tech, dual use technologies, tech transfer with a focus on China's military industrial base. And so my question for you both, you know, as, as, as we've discussed and as you both have mentioned, the U.S. and especially the U.S. China tech challenge, et cetera, um, the use of sanctions and export controls, it, it's very front and center here. And so my question for you both, do you, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, it's a very basic question, but, but what do you both think about the future of US-China tech relations? Because having conducted dual, um, excuse me, do, do, oh goodness, do, um, why, why am I, my brain, my brain, my brain, due diligence, excuse me, <laughs> due diligence investigations on Chinese companies, their requests for, you know, technologies and et cetera. Having done those investigations and just being, just knowing a, a lot about the um, Chinese military civilian fusion, it seems because of the politics around this, how front, how front and center of this discussion is about sanctions and export controls, that the future of US-China tech is just bleak. Uh, what, what do you both think? Is A lot of folks are saying, you know, we gotta stop sanctioning Chinese entities, but having seen what we do, we should be concerned about that. So I'm, I'm curious to know both of your thoughts about what you think the future of this will be. Is there even a way that we can maybe alleviate relations or is this just going to be inevitable that there will just be politics surrounding the use of sanctions, export controls, et cetera? Thank you. Well, I think it's inevitable. Uh, after all, Xi Jinping has announced his intention to have a dominant position in a large number of global markets by 2049. Hmm. He's identified the technologies in which he wants to be a, a world leader, at least if not a dominant player. Those right. are exactly the critically emerging technologies that have been identified by the Trump and now the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And it's inconceivable that the United States will allow China, therefore, with that kind of challenge laid before the United States, to, 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 re to relax its constraints over a large number of these technologies. It might right. be a little bit more discriminatory, a little bit more carefully thought out, but at the right. moment, I think it's inevitable that there's going to be a great deal of conflict and tension between the two. Maybe mm -hmm. Mario. Yeah, so uh, philosophically, I think nothing is inevitable if, uh, if people are uh, involved. But of course, I agree uh, that uh, the prospect is rather bleak. I mean, um, everything seems to um, point in the direction of uh, severe and heavy and uh, long lasting conflict. Uh, and that is not just an American um, uh, a Chinese problem. I mean, Europe is also trying to, to position itself uh, in a new way, right? There's a lot of uh, talk about geopolitics of technology, whatever that means, but there is uh, this idea that Europe needs to reinvent its position in a geopol geopolitical field and think much more about uh, technology. So there, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on that will shake up uh, the, uh, the technological world of, of uh, today. Uh, I'm not sure how everything will look like in the ne next five years, but uh, I'm not an optimist at all. Right, especially if this uh, National Party Congress, the 20th National Party Congress is coming up, I believe, goodness, this year, I forget which month, but that will that will tell us whether or not Xi Jinping will realize a third term. So mm -hmm. most yeah. of what you were saying about the technologies that he's focused on, yes, yes, very bleak, <laughs> very bleak. Yeah. And sometimes, oh, sorry. Oh, I just said thank you both. Oh, Go ahead. okay. No, I was just saying very bleak. I, it reminds me, um, there was an old KGB joke. Uh, on the exam um, that future KGB officers had to take. Um, and the question was, uh, what was the relative position of the US and the Soviet Union? Um, and the answer uh, was that the, the United States was standing on the edge of a cliff looking into the abyss and the position of the Soviet Union was catching up quickly. <laughs> um, and um, and I sometimes think about that with the U.S. and China, because in many ways they they are riven by very similar internal tensions and 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 problems, despite the the massive ideological differences between the two. But anyway, um, let me um, 
let me wind things up here. It is 1.02. Um, so let me thank uh, Mario and John for, for taking the time to do this today. Um, it's a, just a, a pleasure to have been able to listen to you. Um, I, for what it's worth, couldn't recommend the book more highly. Um, it really is um, not only of great contemporary policy relevance, but just as a work of scholarship um, is, is just very impressive. Um, so thank you to you both. Um, and then thanks to, to Jeff and Michelle for, for giving us the opportunity to do this. Um, and let me, shall I turn it over to you, Jeff, for the last word? Kate, you have the last word. My thanks, but you have the last word. Oh, okay. Well, I should have saved my, uh, my, my KGB joke to the very end then, uh, had I known. <laughs> All right. Well, then I, I will just say again, here's the, here's the book uh, available on Amazon. Um, you should all go buy it. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I think that's it. So thanks again to, uh, to everyone, um, and especially to uh, Mario and John. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Thank you, Kate. Bye. Thanks, Mario. Thanks, John. Certainly. Thanks, Bye, Jeff. everybody. Thanks, Bye. Take Bye. care. We'll see you, Kate. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.